Afternoon, coaches. Welcome to Daily Sports Science Locker Room Podcast. Uh, we've got Mark Dorn back with us this week, Daniel St. Ledger. Uh, Mark, great to see you back. I know you, I know you don't want to discuss your health issues here, but I know you had a wee bit of, wee bit of an operation there recently, but you're back on your feet there. You had the appendix, was it? Yeah, yeah the appendix, but I look, I'm actually enjoying the, well, I'm enjoying the line about the house and yeah. Netflix from one end, of the, <laughs> one end of the day to the other. Jeez, that's what Daniel does in a normal week, don't he? That's what Daniel I know, does. He in a used, I know, you know what used to school teach your feel like during you know, every day. <laughs> Mark, right, did, Mark, did you watch that? Did you watch that Israeli show I sent you? <laughs> no, I didn't get. I wouldn't watch it all yet. Ah, get into it. It's very good. <laughs> very good. Well, here, listen, I let you two add it after the show. But here, listen, lads, look, it's great, great to have you back, Mark. It's good to see you back in your feet again. And, uh, you know, as, as well, from a coaching perspective, like, obviously, coaching does take a lot out of us, and it's important we, we, we look after ourselves. But, lads, look, just we'll, we'll come back. We're a bit late in the week this week for reviewing games, but we're talking about Donegal to own a little bit. And one thing sort of struck me this week, lads, we're coming up with, with, with what we're going to discuss this. We're going to chat a wee bit more differently about a coaching angle and how teams are coaching, any tactical innovations that we've seen this year. One thing that sort of stood out for me was like, you know, probably Tyrone, it's, it's probably careful what you wish for. I know when, when Doher and, 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 and Logan came in, two boys won in all Ireland. And that was obviously the, the COVID year. And, you know, people can talk about how fortunate it was, et cetera, et cetera. And fine margins, Murphy missing the penalty and, you know, then getting sent off and how fine. But you need that bit of luck too to win in all. And you can't take that away from them, the, the one in all Ireland. But this Tyrone team just looked a little bit rudderless, a little bit, uh, just a, a team that nearly didn't have a plan, didn't have a shape, didn't really have any sort of uh, kick-out strategy. Whereas Donegal are the complete opposite. Like they all, there's all this talk of harmony in the camp, and uh, but there's a clarity of their roles. Like and there's obviously a, a real defiant uh, game plan in place. Not just one game plan, but obviously an element of game plans. And like just even to start off, lads, like Mark, you've been around coaching a long time. I knew Daniel. Like. The plan, having a plan of of any capacity, is better than no plan, Mark. Like, you know. Yeah, but I think it's very important. Yes, everybody needs to have a plan, but it's very important you have maybe a plan B and a plan C too. Because look, if you're if only one thing to the bow, you're in trouble. And look, to be fair, you mentioned Donegal there, and look, and it is when you look at Donegal this time last year. I mean, you look at them now, now, now. To be fair, I know there's four or five players back in that weren't in last year, but you can see their structure. It's just like, and it's not, it's not, it's not that Jimmy Guinness came out and put a real magic formula. It's a real, like you can see, it's a low block defense. We're narrow. When you turn the ball over, we can go at pace. And if we can't get a pace, then they'll go that, build the score and they'll flood the lanes. And it's, look, it's a wee bit, to be fair, it is a wee bit like Derry last year. Maybe just not as pacey as Derry, but they do, once a team gets everybody back, they do try and match up the 1v1s. And then it's just somebody missed the tackle. But it, it probably they're kicked out. Like they're kicked out even if things press up and Patton's going long. Look, it's not again. It's not rugby. Every Donegal player knows if Patton's going long with our half backs charging onto it, if he goes, and it's just it's just wee tiny things. But look, you go back to looking at throwing them. So every throw in the first half, probably were happy enough. But like you, it did if you were watching the game, think, well, there's Donegal, a real structure. Everybody bought into the game plan. Or it's maybe in the flip side, if you're being really cold about it, maybe in throwing, you're maybe going. Maybe their game plan just isn't up where Donny Gauls is, or maybe maybe look, maybe we're maybe they have a good game plan. Players just aren't bought into it. But just when you look at Donny Gaul, you just know there's a team. Everybody's yeah. bought into the structure. Everybody knows their job. Look, there's no doubt Jim McGinnis maybe goes through in the third Tuesday and Thursday night. This is your job. I've no doubt the whole, not just the fifteen, but the whole thirty in Donny Gaul's squad know exactly. What I'm doing, if I'm coming on for X, Y, and Z, I know what I'm doing and where I'm be. If I lose the ball and know where to go, everybody knows exactly. But it's it's all right having the plan. But the thing that most impressive about Donegal is everybody's bought in to, and everybody's going to do it, and they're battling for each other. And it's just that it means. It, to be fair, it means if you look like Ryan McHugh had a very quiet game again. I think it was our man lost for final and yeah. still won the game. And yeah. like, if you look Ryan McHugh again, Derry, Ryan McHugh destroyed Derry. The whole talk was. And Derry, oh geez, and Derry were stupid for not man Martin Ryan McHugh. Yet Armagh went man marked him, and Donny Gall still won the game. Look, and I know it's cliche, but it's the trust the process. The process yeah. won the game. It's, it just shows once one or two boys are took out of it or not in their day, they're trusting the pro process, and somebody else is stepping up to the mark. And look at Potter Mogan, like probably at the minute, spend the football of his life. Mm. Yeah, you you were always a big believer, Ledge, in that as well, weren't you? Like that, you know, having the having a structure, having a plan, like it, it gives you confidence as a player. And and as you used to say, I remember you used to say to me, like you know, for one or two players missing, you'd say, but look, you know, 
it's not really about him, it's about the system, you know, and, and it is a great point Mark makes there, like, you know, individual greatness will get you, will win your games, and there's times where you need that wee bit of a spark, and uh, you talk about moments, you know, that your best player might not have a great game, but he might have a moment that decides a big game, you know, but it's still the structure, it's still the shape, it's still the system that keeps you in the, keeps you in the game ledge and takes you down the home stretch. You definitely, and like I, I think let's look at Donny Gall first. They don't have anyone like that. You could say their individual player would have been, let's say, Paddy McBearty. He's having less and less of an influence on 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 the grand scheme. You know, Absolutely. he's tipping he's tipping in here and there, but like as we see, McGuinness, if if he's not suited to a particular game, McGuinness will whip him out or he won't start him. And yeah. look, that that's a very dangerous. That's a it's a powerful thing because ultimately, then it makes you very hard to, as as Mark said, you can't just nail down one player. Then so it's like it, it's a case of well, if we if we mark McHugh, we'll win the game, and that's, that's not the case anymore. But but back to the original point on on Tyrone, like. I, I think they're, they're probably a moment's team. They're probably... We lost Daniel there, did we, Mark? I think we lost him a wee bit there, did we? Are you back? Nope, still. Yeah, I think we've lost him there. But no, listen, uh, just to what he was saying there about Tyrone, Mark, like he talked, Les talked about mo- being a moment team, like, you know, they're, they're a moment's team, like, but... Like for me as well, for me as well, there's got to be there's got to be a, a time when uh, there's got to be a time when, you know, you actually coach different moments in the game. You know, you've got to have you've got to have a, a, an element where you're coaching certain moments. You know, right? Are we going to press now? When are we going to drop off, etc.? Cetera, et cetera. Surely that's the case too, Mark. The teams have to prepare for every eventuality. Yeah, look, there's no doubt you do. But just sometimes when you look at Tyrone, and this is no, this is no like if you look at the two Canavans and Dar McCurry, they are three marquee players and they do rely a lot on moments and sometimes I don't know the three boys but you're just wondering how much would they buy into maybe being set look this is what we're doing we need to do this X, Y and Z here how much do they buy into that because look, we're saying stuff yes going looking by Donegal and looking at Tyrone you say Tyrone definitely nowhere near as organised or structured as Donegal but is that because maybe players don't buy into it as much I don't know but Definitely, like it's you did look at the game, especially in the second half, where it did look as if Tyrone maybe were a wee bit all over the place. Whereas in the first half, they did make a bit of a game of it. But in saying that, Rui Cal they missed a couple of scores the first half. Probably would he would have normally kicked in the sleep. Uh, Dar Cam and a goal chance. Maybe had it went in. It might have kept the minute. But looking at just being coldly looking at it, you said Donegal definitely more organised, definitely more bought into. But if you flip the three four weeks ago. Tyrone probably three points up again. Donegal, you know, says yes. Tyrone had them beat, or Donegal thrown them beat here. So look, it did they mm-hmm. make a big difference in three or four weeks? And there's no doubt Donegal took serious confidence out of winning Ulster, and they're now playing with that wee bit even more freedom. It's nearly something you would nearly not associate with Jim McGuinness. A yeah. real freedom at times in the second half, and like 10, 12, it's their angle of runs, it's their support, and the mm. ball, man, the ball. You'll never see a man with Donegal, the ball carry a left isolated. He'll always have three and four options. Yeah. Sorry, Ledger, we lost you there, but we're just chatting about a different most of the game. You were saying about Tyrone, they're more a moment team. Yeah, I, th- I think so. And, and look, we we talked last week about the amount of transition, and there, there's quite a number of young players coming through, like that 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 are being integrated at that te- into that team at the moment. And look, I, I think from a coaching side of it, you you try and put in, I won't even call it a plan, but you put in principles, you know, that that you want the lads to kind of go with for the, for in a, in a broad sense, you want you want principles, but it's very hard, to, as you said, to, to to coach for the for the decision making within the moments, especially. Especially for teams, let's say that are, or for young fellas that are playing maybe only their fifth, sixth, seventh day championship game, to know what to do in a specific scenario, that that takes that takes time to kind of bed in. And you know, uh, from a from a coaching point of view, I think Tyrone just lack the game sense of when they need to speed it up or when they need to slow it down. And look, you'd, you'd, I would have assumed there was probably enough leaders to be able to dictate that in that Tyrone team at the moment. But but it just looks like they still have the balance. A, a little bit, a little bit iffy. Now, I, I think the weekend is probably exacerbated by the fact that Donegal give you so such a little opportunity to hit them on the counter attack. Like mm-hmm. the, the the one opportunity where Donegal probably had a sloppy turnover was the, was Derek Hanavan's chance, and you could think you you saw straight away, oh, this this, this is a goal chance because all of Donegal had attacked as Mark said, they flood 14, 15 players into that half of the field. I I think what Donegal do really well, and this is what this is what probably. It's probably elevating them week on week. And in my opinion, I wasn't sure about them, but they are getting better. 
they probably finish with either a score or a dead ball with, I'd say, 75, 80% of their attacks. That means every time that they attack, the ball is going dead and they're reset for a kickout. If Donegal get into this transitional game where it's up, down, up, down, all of a sudden they can't get into their defensive block as religiously. All of a sudden they're like, obviously, again, Donegal's size, I, I think, is probably an, an understated element that if they have four monsters at the back of their press, like the more kickouts for them either side of the ball, the better. I think that's a really kind of underappreciated element of their game. But they have they have that I think game awareness of mo of, of what the moment needs in a certain time. So yes, their principle is Ray card in transition. But if they're sensing that okay, this mightn't be on, they're more than happy to go back into a slow lateral game for a couple of minutes and pick their pick their times. That I think that's really good coaching because you have your principles. Your basic element is yes, we want to get numbers behind and break fast. But if that's not working, we have to think our way around that. And I think that's where Donegal are probably slightly ahead. They're they're that they're thinking on field. I think is is quite impressive at the moment. Yeah, and let's just to just to back up what you said there as well. When you do get into those yo-yo phases, like you know, no team likes to be chasing. They like to be facing. You know, you want to get back. You want to get set. And even if your press is a middle third press, if it's a full press, if it's a deep block. You want to be facing, you know, you don't want to be scrambling back where you have a situation with five or six men of their back to the ball, they're chasing the play. And that ultimately is where a lot of teams are going to concede scores on that turnover phase. And if you can limit your turnovers, really limit them, then obviously it increases your chances of winning games. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And and just with, with the club at the moment, we've we've a real issue around that at this time. And it's something we're trying to trying to coach. And it's a hard one because you know, you want lads to pick that pass. You want lads to, to take a chance to break. Oh, at, in Dublin at the moment, a lot of teams are playing quite are playing low block enough stuff. You know, it it, it is attritional at times, and and you want lads to try and break that down. But what's happening is we're we're turning over ball at times, and we're being exposed on the counter attack, and and we're trying to get that balance of, yes, have have a go at a pass, lads. We don't want you to we don't want you to play soft, but at the same time. It's knowing when that pass is on and when that's not on. And that's really hard to get through to them. And look, that's the beauty of we have a 15 game league that we can be practicing this the whole time and coming to the championship. But it's it that that takes that takes a lot of time to, to to try and get through to lads that you don't want to cripple them with fear about turnovers either, but you have to give them you have to kind of make them aware that at at the level we're talking about here, if you turn over ball high up the field when you're not in set defense, teams are going to rip you apart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you agree, Mark? Yeah, look, to be fair, but the one thing you see, and I actually thought Donegal done this well in the National League. A couple of times they were caught up the field, but look, they stopped the play. I know they, they did stop. They get, I know it's clinical or it's what you people call it, but, but they do. Now, they were caught again the other day again with Dar Callum's goal hurt, and was probably one time they were caught. But I remember I seen him in the league game, and I think it was again our man athletic grounds. A couple of times they were caught up the field, and instead of letting the play, but they stopped the play. They stop the play right away. So it's obviously, look, and the level of coaching goes into even that. No one are up the field. We're not going to get caught in the break. We're stopping the play. Somebody, and it's not a black chart. It's a foul. And it's just, they're so cute. Look, it's Jim again. They're so cute there. And like, to be fair, Donny, or the game now, they just throw. That's the first time I actually seen them getting caught in the break in a long time. Since yeah, but Martin, you know, there's an element of, as you say, coaching that. Like, take Man City for example. Like, you know, and they're a great example of of one of the best teams in in English football over the last number of years. But like Guardiola, like, remember Solskjaer coming in years ago and saying, tactically, tactically, they're actually the best team in the league at tactical fouling. And like, yeah. you know, I don't want to sound like a complete nutter cynic here, like, but it well, is. Well, I would say Donny Gall still the best. Yeah, at, but, the it, minute. but that's insane. Dublin, it is. To be fair, yeah, Dublin, Dublin, Dublin. I was just going to say that. Dublin yeah, I think it is. for years. Dublin whether we like it or not, though, Mark, yeah. whether we like it or not, it's a massive part of the game and disrupting the game. And what it does is, as well as Led says, like it just disrupts the flow of a game, like you know, and makes it really frustrating, isn't it? Like, and then obviously, then you you react then with it with a foul or a card or whatever, you know what it is. It is frustrating. Like, it yeah, well, I I know it. I remember a lot. I mean, I know the call. I remember a game I went down and watched Kearney three and a couple of years ago. Funny enough, Paddy's first year, and they're playing a, a double whistle game. And I supposed okay. to double whistle for it. <laughs> Whenever I blow the double whistle, ball turned over, it's foul, stop the play. You know, right, okay. and it's just, but that's, but even like we're talking about Dublin and Kerry, they're at this, but people, especially Dublin, people have sometimes at this, and uh, sometimes, and they are the best team ever to play, but tended last or something, mm. because when they were broke, caught, especially under Jim Galvin, we're caught in the break a couple of times. They stopped the play. Mm. They stopped it like, I think it was about, somebody stopped and allowed everybody to get back in. Where Donny Gall are really good at that now. Bar the Darley Calvin chance against. I just noticed that day again. Our man, the athletic grounds, the league game. They were caught twice and stopped the play right away. They were never getting hit in the break. 
Yeah, and any that ledge like you know, obviously all winners are ruthless. Like you know, there's there's no question about that. Like, but it's mad because we're a mad association, GA. Like everyone's talking about Donegal now, what McGuinness has done, and you know we're very much a, a copycat association. Like you know, so every club team in the country now is trying to play structured attacks and with the way Derry play. Like, and it's not easy to do that because when you commit so many bodies forward, you know, into a very very condensed space, like you're very vulnerable in on a counter attack. You know, and surely Les, there has to be an element of you look at your players you look at what you have and you tailor you tailor your game around the quality that you have in a group rather than trying to copy you know a template from somewhere else that's important for coaches too isn't it like yeah i, th- I think so i think so and and <clears throat> there's definitely there's an, definitely an element of a lot of teams especially up here in dublin will are, are kind of playing you might like maybe not where dublin are now but remember that all, all ireland final last year when dublin played Kerry and they just said Let's, let's get 13, 14 in behind that 45 and let's see you can carry break us down. A lot of teams like are, are adopting that and a lot of good teams who probably don't necessarily need to, to win league games or championship games in Dublin are doing that. And, and it is, there probably is an element of looking at what works for one team and saying, well, that's going to work for us. Like I, I talk about a story lots. Remember when Pat Gilroy had the boys doing the six o'clock sessions in DCU yeah. with Dublin 2010, 2011. I remember we tried to do that with Carl once or twice. And it was like, well, that's grand for all the Dublin lads who are living around DCU. And, I mean, and the, boys really coming, the Carl boys were only coming home for the night, eh? I was thinking, holy <laughs> Jesus. All you, to, all you had to do was pissing lads off. And actually, we, we, we must come back to, we must come back to, to kind of setting standards here. We haven't talked about it at the end, maybe, but your weekend. But but the, the point, the point, the overall point is you have to look at your what you have and what suits your players. Like, and it's so like a, a lot of times, a lot of times, in fairness, though, we have probably a proto a prototype of a player at the moment. That's I saw Brian Sheen doing an article about athletes becoming footballers rather than turning footballers more athletic and or something like that. And he's probably like we have a lot of players now who are really good at that counter-attack game. Get to the 45, tackle, run hard, hand pass, get it to your one or two shooters. That's probably where the game has gone again. And whether we like it or lump it, that's probably the reality, you know. And it's, 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 it's kind of, there is an onus on, on coaching and managers and the rest of it to, to, to be individual in your thinking. Like maybe that game does suit you and that's absolutely fine. But, you you definitely have to look to your strengths and not think about not try and transform players into something that they're not maybe or work with something that they are you know it's inter- it's interesting comments led from Brian Sheehan, and Mark you know I remember years and years ago now lads a long time ago now I don't know if you use by well use boys are old enough for fuck's sake is it well you're me well you are right still only young me are on the me but I remember the German <laughs> teams lads the German teams of years ago right in soccer there were all these like big tall athletic functional players right and they flopped that I can't remember what competition they flopped that the early noughties they flopped they flopped badly somewhere so they've done like a sort of a branch review of what they were doing wrong at a development squad level what they were doing wrong at coaching and they were looking for the wrong type of stereotype of player you know the athletic strong so what they started to work on obviously was the technical gifted player and the likes of Tom, uh, Thomas Muller and these guys that you know that were around for a long time they all came through and they were all harnessed through the, the system but they really what they really done lads was they made coaching qualifications much harder to get in the country and and that was a big thing for me is that like in the GA you don't actually have any real coaching qualifications like it's like there's a lot of men out there now coaching that have actually no qualifications whatsoever maybe a foundation or whatever but you have your level one your level two but like there has to be marked some form of like elite coaching qualification to coach an inter-county level now you 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 work hard i take for example the likes of luke barrett there in donegal and and luke listens to the show and i know he's he's a member of the dss community like and luke is a hard working coach like with a serious work ethic he's done a master's in applied sports a uh, uh, leadership sports coaching actually sports coaching whatever it is but he, he's done his studies but also as well he's trolled the troll of the path of of shadowing people uh, going and looking at sessions, going to coaching it. Every coaching day that I would have landed to, that man was there. You were there too, Mark yourself, Daniel. You've you started the tour of the country, looking at these coaching coaching uh, conferences and coaching coach education nights, and they are important, lads. But I do feel, Mark, that some of the coaching now, even at inter county level, is extremely poor. Extremely poor. Yeah, no, I would agree. And that, like, there's there's probably a script out there. I actually think it's harder, and this is it's easier to get involved in inter county team than it is to get a really good club team, you'll have to go through a serious process to get a you know a really top club team where sometimes you might just roll in an inter-county just because you know X, Y and Z and he rings you there or there. But there's one thing I will say, and you know this and Daniel know this, like players don't belong spotting. Absolutely. If you're not up to it. And they yeah. don't belong spotting 
uh, coaches maybe they say, well, this place maybe just talks a talk, but actually can't walk the walk. And that's the one thing I would say, but I would agree with you. There is a lot of, I don't want to say poor, because everybody look with standard, maybe depth at inter county level that it, there is, and maybe there is some process you have to go through. I don't know, but I do agree with there is it probably the, the level of coaches sometimes at inter county level probably isn't what it isn't elite. But you must yeah. where if you look at some of the top clubs, I do believe it's harder to get a top club job than it is to get involved. But I think, Mark, as well, the development squad, like development squad levels, we have that crucial phase, led, you know, of that development, right? So, for example, take, for example, the other day, we were in an area learning meeting the other day in, in schools. All the, the PE teachers uh, across town, Nuri and Moore, had to meet. And I was looking around the room going, like, you know, just take, for example, off the top of my head, the likes of Niall McAleen and Marty O'Rourke, uh, Jody Gormley's there, you know, these guys are all managing senior club teams, right? And you're looking around the room going, like, all their school lads, all the kids at their school are getting exposed to a good level of coaching, Dorney, right, lads? They're all getting yeah. exposed to a decent level of coaching. The lads here are lucky as well. We've got good lads here in the staff that give up their time and get and, and coach the lads really well. So those lads go back to their clubs and they get a bit of coaching in their clubs, but then they might be fortunate enough to go to development squad level, but because development squad isn't really that attractive for anybody, they might be a bit disorganised, it might be a bit ad hoc, you know, and the players are thinking, well, that's not the way I'm getting coached in school and these are the standards, these are the levels. And they go to university and they get top coaching. And then, Tony, as you say, they maybe land into their senior club team and just Joe blogs from down the road because he's handy, he's there, he's coaching. And boys are going like, this is not good coaching. I've been exposed to this. So players aren't stupid, lads. Like. They're not stupid, like, you know. Yeah, they'll always sniff out the bullshit fairly quickly, like, you know, and... and... And look, and again, again, it depends on your exposure. I mean, if you're lucky enough to go to a good school, for example, or if you're lucky enough to get um to get into a development squad, yes, you you will you will pick up on that very quickly. And look, I, I get going, going to the issue of let's say the theory of coaching and how do you qualify? What 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 quali- quantifies a better coach? You know, I for me anyway, I still think a better coach. The, the I think it's the, the delivery of the message. I think is the fucking fundamental as far as I'm concerned. Like. I like I you could you could you could write all the forms and do all the tests and all that kind of stuff, but uh, until players buy into you and how you deliver, I genuinely I, I I don't see any particular plan as a reckless plan in GEA as such. As long as it's delivered clearly and players are fully bought into it, I think it's the delivery of the the delivery of the message and the the kind of as you you always use the phrase and it's a bit bit corny, but what is it? Uh, players want to know you care, they won't care till you see you care, whatever it is, like. Players, I, I think that's the key element to this. And it's kind of a, it's a notional thing that's very hard to put a, put a, a qualification on as such. But it's, I, I think, I think it's a critical element that's, that's missing. And there is no doubt about it. There are journey people that float around between clubs and, and but mo- mostly counties at the moment that will, will go in and will do a job for a couple of years and move on to the next job. I think yeah. players are smelling that out really, really quickly at the moment. And look, a friend of mine was talking to Jar Brennan the other day and he was chatting about the difference between club management and inter county management. Jar said inter county management is so much easier compared to club management because you have none of the, the nitty gritty stuff that you have to get involved with uh, as yeah. a club. And, and as Mark says, like there, there's a huge process to go through because you probably have to be, <laughs> you have to be coach, you have to be a manager, you have to be a psychologist, you have to be a delegator, you have to organize the pitches, balls, all the stuff that goes with club management. It's a massive, massive commitment as, as we all know. Like, But it, it inter-county stuff, it's much clearer in, in so far as it's organized, it's there for you. And it's probably easier on your, uh, maybe not easier on your time, but it's, it, it's easier in the sense there's less kind of, let's say, strings that go with it. And I think a lot of managers, especially around the inter-county scene, will be happy to go to Division 4, Division 3 counties, who look are, are desperate for anyone because there's not exactly a whole lot of people that are mad to take them and will 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 just bounce around. And I don't think that's I don't think that's healthy. It's not healthy for a county board who are spending 60 grand a year on someone who's only there for the short term. I, I, I'm not sure that's a really fantastic use of resources when you've got underage and all the rest of it that tend to be floundering. Like you, you look at any Division 4 county at the moment, let's say, just for example, how many of their underages are flourishing? Not a whole lot. Yeah, and, and probably ledge on top of that as well with the inter-county, you have more manpower. There's more delegation. So you can actually say, well, look, you take that, you take this. Like, as you're marking up the road to Wicklow, like, you're not going up the road just to take the warm-up. Like, you're going up the road to take the majority of the session, the majority of the football. It was the same with me, Ledge, with Carlo, Roscommon. You know, you want to be there. And you, if you're coming down the road, you want to be taking most of the coaching. So the manager, in, 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 in an essence, 
is more of a facilitator and a delegator rather than, than a manager. But yeah. I think Mark as well, you know, what one one point that Edge made there and it's interesting, like particularly at inter county level, like and I think it's important at inter county level because at club level, you have two or three egos in the group, you know, big egos who are big personalities. And you know, then you'll have your introverts, you'll have such a mix. But at inter county level, you'll tend to have the best players from every club who are who are, you know, all not saying egos, but they're all the harder players to, to nearly yeah. manage. And you know, that's an important element of coaching and management is actually getting the players to believe in you, getting the best out of the players, Mark, getting the best out of the players uh, and improving the players. Improving Yeah, the players. well if you think look, and you mentioned thing there, at least one thing a big plus inter county, you're not gonna have I actually said, my granny's sick, I have to go and feed Hayes, or, you know, where the club train, you will hear excuses, you can't come and say, where's Enter County? You're guaranteed nearly they're 30, 31, unless, like, I'm no way of concert with club train, it's easy for a player mm. to miss club train, so that's one thing, but just, you brought a thing up there, like, and I think, we're talking about coaching, and if you, I think if you're involved in a group of players, and you walk away in that group of players, you would say, well, he made me better, I just look at Rory Gallagher yeah. with Derry, and he's away now, but every Derry player will say he's made me better. Uh, yeah. Mally O'Rourke, I just remember the time involved in Mullahan, or sorry, in Bally Bay, the Bally Bay boy, Paul Finley, and that's all. Well, Rourke came in, he made us better. He made me a better. So I think if a coach goes in somewhere and you can say, look, there's, he's making me better. I mm. think that's, you may not, because look, at the end of the day, you don't, there's only certain teams win stuff, but I think as a coach, if you can go in somewhere and whenever your team's finished two and three years, say, well, look, he made me better. That's a good thing. But look, Dan mentioned the thing there, and I actually was talking not on the name. I was actually talking to an inter county manager four weeks ago in Dublin one day. I just actually bought and I was talking away. He was talking about Slot Mail and says, How do you know? We're talking and I says, You go back to club. He says, I'll never go back to club. I says, Why? Well, he says, Far too, that's too much work in club manager. Yeah. And this is an inter, this, but not, this man was is managing an inter county team. He says, to Me, far too much work. In club, my I have never will I go by. I'm having enough in county. I get my coaches in, they get to do this, sure. and I just I manage yeah. the group. And that's yeah. you know, it's that they're yeah. doing that route, yeah, yeah. But no, look, listen, it's 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 no matter what level you're coaching at, lads, whether it's school, whether it's club, whether it's county, you know, it, it takes it takes effort, lads, it takes preparation, it takes up a lot of time, you know, and a lot of emotional energy because when you leave the session as a player. The only thing you're thinking about is your own game. Whereas when you leave as a coach, you're thinking the warm up go well, the session flow well. What was wrong with Daniel there tonight? Mark seemed a bit off it as well. You know, Jesus, you know, Ryan was going really well. You know, you're thinking about everyone. And it does consume a lot of your it consumes your mind. Like it's 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 a serious, serious thing. You know. We had we had a bit of a review meeting on Tuesday. We we kind of have we've these double game weeks up here at the moment where you play Wednesday, Saturday, then you've ten days off Wednesday, Saturday. So, so there's not much time for training. So it's mostly it's mostly discussions, walkthroughs, that kind of stuff. And we had a review meeting Tuesday and you come out of it thinking, I wonder what that player meant by what he said there. Is is he not happy with one element? Is he it, did that lad mean something different? And as you say, you're consumed with it. Like I've been thinking about it for the last two days, and you're trying to you're trying to to see what's right, what's real, and what's not real. But it it, it is it is it is all consuming. Like it's so hard not to. It's no so hard not to come home after a training session. You mightn't talk to anyone because you're just thinking about it for an hour or two hours afterwards. You know it's, it, it. There is there is an awful lot in it. Like and and in fairness, the I, I know the volunteerism element or whatever you want to call it, whether that's an under ten team. Or whether it's doing a development squad, like it's it's the greatest part of the GA is the volunteerism, but also it's probably the great it's it's the it's the trickiest part as well because as you say when it comes back to that qualification and what is actually what is actually happening on the field, it's very easy for someone to say, well, I'm giving up my time to do this for free. You come and you come and do it better, you know. So it's but, but probably having something a little bit more formal, I I think is a good idea. Just go back to that original point uh, in in the qualification element is probably would be no harm, I'd say. Well, I, I would like to see, I know Jarlath Burns has talked about all sorts of things and it's, that's going to happen in his tenor and a lot of these presents come in and a lot of stuff doesn't happen. Like, you know, it's, it's just a sort of like a politician telling you, I'm going to do this, I'm going to have great health care, I'm going to have great education. And then the next thing you know, it all collapses in around you. But look, I do think Jarlath will be will, will be will be good. I think he'll be effective. He's been very outspoken on a number of issues as well. I, I'm going to completely argue with him here as well, lads, just while we have it. Like, I think the GA goal is an absolute farce. I think the fact that, you know, the head of RT Sport, Daniel McBennett, is, is a 
director in GA I think it's just absolutely unbelievable. But I'm surprised that 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 he actually came out with those comments. Like, there's my father, for example, lads. And I think it's important we do mention this. Like, the coverage of our sport at the minute, lads, I think is very poor. So I'll give you a great example on Saturday, and I know, Led, you 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 think that my phone got broke over the weekend because it's having a few pints. But on Saturday, I went watch the FA hey, Cup. Stephen, Stephen, Stephen. The last time you were on was twenty to twelve on Sunday evening. That's all I got to say. Hear me out. Hear me out. But on Saturday, you went to watch the FA Cup final, right? And then Saturday night, you've got Donegal playing her own. But it's not on anywhere. It's not in any bar in Nuri. It's nowhere, like, because it's on GA Go, you know. And it is frustrating, lads. And the night that Down played our man, the seven cab, we were in the car, actually, and we left the house early. We, we had a match uh, in now the league match in now and we went up the road early to, fi- to find a, a bar somewhere that we could sit before the game, have a coffee, and watch the, the, the first half of Down in our man. But it wasn't on anywhere. It actually wasn't on anywhere. My father rang me, and he says, how do I get this game? And he's like, you know, and it's it's debilitating for people, Mark. Like the GA go, no. I don't think is a. It's a uh, I think experiment. it's a complete look. I, it's I, a so I was on the thing. I was under. I was under illusions. Was the GA go was brought out was because without the top games, all the top games would be on RTE, right? But the GA go then was about five, five or six games who they give a wee bit of publicity to them. Lesser counties would be on GA go, but the fact like. I'll even go, and I don't like talking about another sport, but I heard Cork and Limerick, one of the, apparently one of the best, scandal. I did watch it here in the house, one scandal. of the best hurling <laughs> games ever to play wasn't on RTE. Yeah, down, down, down in our man, an Ulster semi-final, local derby, not to be on BBC or RTE, but it's a complete sham. Tyrone and Donegal, one of the top games yeah. not yeah. to be on RTE. Like, it is absolutely, I was under illusions GA Go was going to be brought in for a third division game here, or maybe RTE was showing Dublin and Kerry, uh, on a Sunday or Saturday evening, and RT was going to show Donny and throw on the Sunday, but Monaghan was playing Kerry at the same time. So GA Go with what I thought that's what GA Go was going to be brought in for. But well, just Mark, just want to have weekend. you, just want to have you, Mark. This this weekend, lads, it was common Mayo GA Go. Cavan Dublin GA go awfully temporary and the hurling is in TT4. Uh, Meath and Kerry are an RTE. Like, who wants to watch that? Oh, I'm not being funny, lads. Like, that, that's, no, but that's me, a, me that's a hockey match. Like, that's a is. hockey match. Like, that's 20 point win for Kerry, right? Derry and Arma on RTE. Yes, you've ticked the box there. And then Slag Antrim GA go, like, on the football. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's. it's Steve, no. Stevie, just, just to jump to jump in on that one, right? Let, let, let's kind of break it down. Firstly, the fact that there's a crossover between RT and GA Go shareholders and the rest of it, that's ridiculous. Okay. So that's straight away yeah, muddy. That muddies any argument for log- like any logical argument can't be made then, really, right? Secondly, there's RT still only have the same amount of games that they're allowed to show, even though there's 27 more football championship games this year. So straight away, there's going to have to be a picking and, and choosing, right? But. What, what I find, the, the, the narrative has been skewed by this a small bit by people who are kind of maybe plugging for the split season to finish or plugging, plugging for more time, blah, 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 eating into the club season. But the reality is, right, <laughs> you go to any any uh, rural GA, any club anywhere, any GA club on a Saturday morning and you look at the nursery, right, and you don't tell me that the GA is in a healthy place. Do you think any six-year-old cares whether he can see Cork and Tipperary and Harland that night? Not a fiddlers. The GA is in a really healthy place at ground level, okay? And I think I think sometimes this, the, the narrative around GA Go has been used to point things in a certain direction that might that might suit individuals' own, own kind of agendas. But what I will say is, like, that example at the weekend, I mean, like, fuck's sake, I mean, how can you have, how can you have Kerry and Mead on, on? And, like, that just looks so blatantly, obviously, like, a little bit pushed. And that's because you have that hierarchy in the RTE is still in GA Go. And that straight away, that just muddies any water. So they've, they've basically made a rod for their own back. And I will, ag- I would agree, I would 100% have watched any of the Munster Hurling Championship games if they were on TV. But I'm probably not going to pay, I'm not going to pay a tenner to watch them, to be perfectly honest. And like, don't get me wrong, the, the 70 quid or whatever it is for the year package, is, is, is yeah, that's absolutely fine. But let's say I'm I'm away, I'm, I have a match Saturday evening. I, I don't get to see them. I could record them on RTE if they're alive. But I'm not going to go back pay for a game that I've already seen the result and go back and watch it again. I'm just probably not going to do that. And look, from an entertainment point of view, I'd love to see those games. Absolutely. But do I feel disconnected from a lot of what's happening at the moment? I probably do. Like, you know, and I I'd, I'd, I'd know, same as you, like I'd watch a lot of football, but there's definitely a, a disconnect, I think. But let's the, the point I make as well is that just for example, I'm only talking about myself here. Like, Dorney, you know, you, you come from a rural club, like, and a, and a proud club in Longstone. Like, but like, I, I, I'm born and reared in Newry here, right? So, Newry is a big, big town, like a big town. Now, officially, it's a city, but it's probably not a city in my eyes, still a town. But Newry Ledge is one of the biggest towns in Down, 
right? If you went into any bar, the point I'm making on Saturday night to watch the GA, you wouldn't be able to watch it anywhere in the town. Like, so you're trying to promote and develop Gaelic games in the town, and people think, oh, that that's not part of it. I do think it's part of it. I think it is part of it that if if you know young people are coming in and watching the football and seeing the football, seeing it on and restaurants, club, and bars, whatever, you know, it, it does make a difference. You know, it's like with soccer; it's it's everywhere. It's plastered everywhere. Like if you have that, like, and I think it's wrong. I do think it's wrong. But look, it's it's not something that that we're going to solve. But looking ahead to this weekend, lads, while we have it, like two standout games for me. We we look at quickly. Obviously, Derry Armagh is the one hundred percent standout game, and then the other game, which I think is an interesting one, is is Roscommon Mayo. I'm not going to delve into it too deeply, lads, because no matter what happens in those two games, all those four teams are still in the championship, regardless of the result, because they only have to win one game. And I do think Derry will beat Westmead. Even if Derry are caught this weekend by Armagh, they'll beat Westmead and they will qualify. But Dorney, talking about Derry Armagh, like it's 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 mouthwatering. Yeah, well, I actually say, I guess, I, yes, you're agreeing they will go through, Richard. Yeah, but just for, t- I think if Armagh would have beat Derry, I think it puts a serious, serious dent. In Derry, even if, I look, it wouldn't. I'm not. I'm only saying this. I'm not. It wouldn't have surprised me entirely if Armagh would have beat Derry. That Westmeath could maybe chin Derry, yeah. even though it's highly unlikely. But the fact is, Derry then would have to go and beat Westmeath. They'd have to play a, a next game against second place team away from home. They go and play. If they win it, then they go and play a quarter final. Obviously, going to be Tyrone or sorry, going to be Dublin, Kerry, Donegal. One from that there. So look. I think this weekend is it's a massive game for Derry, but it's also a massive game for Armagh. Yes, the fact is Armagh will come in a wee bit of a hay because they have the two points. And make no mistake, it's the first time maybe in a couple of years now there is serious pressure on Derry. And they have a few engines. I just think it's a massive, massive game for Derry. And like I actually think if Armagh could go and beat them, I do believe it would put a serious, serious dent in Derry's season. On the flip side, I do think if Derry beat Armagh, they will take massive momentum and they will take massive confidence. But if Armagh go to Celtic Park and will turn Derry over, I do believe it's a serious, serious dent in Derry. And you know then all the wee voices. And look, I just know from... Because if I do be listening to Derry, I obviously do think a lot of Rory Gallagher. And I do believe all them wee questions and the wee voices will come into the head. Look, with Gallagher done this, even though... I still maintain, yes, Derry on their Gallagher were brilliant, but I still maintain, I never seen Derry play as well as what they did that day again, Dublin, in the National League final. Again, Dublin, but uh, to answer your question, look, I think it's a massive, I, I, I actually think it's a serious opportunity for Armagh to yeah. really yeah. put a really big foot, put a foot down. We went to Sally Park and won because there has been thrust through about Armagh Labour. We can't win the big games. The children, I think if Armagh go to Sally Park, when they would take serious momentum into that Galway game, and they would probably use a Comer and that's out for six weeks. It would yeah. be, but I think it's a massive game. I yeah. actually think it's a massive game for both counties. What I'm actually going to, and I can't wait to see it. Oh, but on, Derry, Derry aren't easy beating Celtic Park. No, and Ledge, you know what? From an arm, I respected the committee of the Ulster final, you know, and obviously it was a ma like it's such a difficult one to stomach to Ledge losing again you know, on the game of penalties. But Westmead was the perfect tonic for them, you know. I, I seen Westmead playing a couple of times this year, uh, I seen them playing the league final against Down. I wasn't overly impressed now that night. I thought I thought that was a very, very poor standard of football. But from an arm, perspective, Westmead was the perfect game, Ledge, to get the show back in the road. And obviously, this weekend, then they're going to be facing a wounded Derry, but they're going to be facing a Derry Ledge that are, that are missing a couple of key men. It's really interesting, like how, how, why this game is important for two different reasons. Like, I mean, it, it's you talk about you talk about Derry, like as as as, as Mark said, the the little voices coming back in, and and uh, like ultimately, do Derry after winning the league want to go on a losing streak of 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 three games in a row? Like, and even if yes, even if they do beat Westmead, nobody, no team is in a good place for losing league games. Whether they're injured, whether they are have injuries, whether they've lads missing, doesn't matter. Losing is not good for a team. And then no. you you flip that in its head, and if Arma, even though it's up in Celtic Park, and and Derry are down a few and down a confidence, if Arma again can't get over a, one of the big teams, that's a massive dent in their head as well. Like so, so I, I think psychologically, even though this probably has no bearing on, yes, it who determines who comes second, third, first, whatever. But I think this is a bigger bearing psychologically for both teams, and I think it'll be really hard for a management group to 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 pick either one up off the floor. Even yes, if Derry do go on and beat Westmead, 
I still think, as, as Mark said, those questions are still going to be going to be there. And if Armagh lose, yes, they'll go through. But I, as a player, I'd be thinking, "Fuck me, have we done it yet?" When it when it's really mattered, and that's going to be a big question. That's going to be a massive question. I'm I'm really looking forward to it. I have absolutely no idea what's going to happen. To be perfectly frank, don't rule out penalties or, or draw yeah. even. Yeah, no, I, listen, it, it's going to be, it is going to be a, a war of attrition. It's just a pity now that there wasn't probably more at stake, you know, with it, with it, with a two team qualifying, and it really would have significance then in, in the outcome of the groups, lads, you know. But uh, I suppose, lads, looking at Saturday, a game I was actually thinking about heading down to myself, uh, Roscommon Mayo. Wheels sort of sort of have come off a wee bit for Davy Mark in his second year. You know, they're relegated. Um, you know, they, they, they were poor in Division One this year. I know they've lost a few players. I know Alton Horney's back. Um, a couple of players have gone. I know he lost McHugh as well out of his management team, which isn't always a good good thing either when you lose, you know, your 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 right hand man and you know, well beat by Dublin. Well beat by Dublin, and has has the bubble burst, uh, Mark? Yeah, for yeah. But, uh, look, to be on the outside, look again. We don't know what happens behind closed doors. Maybe there's some on players are back and will help. But from the outside, it definitely looks as if the wheels, the bubbles burst. In the fact, I've just seen a stat the other day: nine games now they've played and they've lost seven. Mm. And look, that doesn't bear well. And to be fair, Roscommon. When I look at Roscommon, I think Roscommon. You know this. You know them better than anybody. But like Roscommon have some serious players. They've mm. serious talent up front, and I actually think they're they're massively underachieving this year. Even though, to be fair, again, Dublin, I watched it on Saturday for 40, 45 minutes. They were really probably, good. Fifty, they probably the only, probably the fact only that six or seven of the lads came back late from St Bridget's, you know, and yeah. didn't really get a proper pre season, and we're in the St Bridget's bubble, and then you're coming. It's hard that like. It yeah, but you think Connor Lass or flip that on the other side, Connor Lass was involved with Len in later stages That's of the last three like, years yeah. and no yeah. breaks. So look, I do think something. You can look at that as an excuse. I just look sometimes for a scumming and go, like, where are they going? Mm. You know, where, and I do on paper when they look at something, scumming's forward lane, you're going, Jesus, they've some well, tell you, I'll tell you what the glass ceiling is. Full back. Well, I'll tell you what the glass ceiling is. It was openly said to me that the glass ceiling is an All Ireland semi final. So, you know, that's they want to get to mm. an All Ireland semi final. And I, I think they have the stuff. You, you Absolutely. Me. I don't think that's unrealistic. I don't think that's unrealistic. Like, you know, when you look at some of the teams, I know, I mean, like Armagh have been in an All Ireland semi final, Mullen have been in an All Ireland semi final, yeah. Derry have been, like, at my age, Roscommon have the players. Like, I watched uh, just even the club games and Bridges again, Glenn, and some of the players. Like the scum and like they've like, good on. I do think they've on their underage are winning. They're they're competitive at under twenty. They're competitive at minor level. They have, but there's just I don't know. Last year you say yeah, started out the league really well, flat the championship. This year now, yeah. I actually think we're talking about a big game for Derek. This is a massive game for David Burke. Mm. This is massive this weekend. Now he yeah. probably will. He's going to be cab in the last round here. But I think yeah. for cut for players, I'm just wondering. And again, I don't know that. I'm only just sitting on the outside. I'm just wondering, mm -hmm. is players floundering a wee bit now? Look, when you're yeah. nine games and seven, whereas you know a big win, they're scumming going to take me out on Saturday. Beat the, you know the whole thing then, galvanize momentum, starts players start buying in again. But if they're beating Saturday again, is, it, is that, oh, now we're, is that, mm -hmm. even though we still have another game to play and we could beat you, in heads, players know our season's over. Yeah, and Ledge on the, on the on the other side of the fence, Ledge, you've got Mayo who obviously had a comprehensive win against Cavan. They'll see this now as another good opportunity, you know, to put two out of two on the board, um, you know, and 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 obviously from from a Mayo uh, perspective, Ledge, they'll know that that last game against Dublin will decide who tops the group. Then you know, obviously it'll be a, it'll be a cracker, but Mayo just quietly they're maybe are they starting to build a wee bit of momentum after the Connacht final defeat. Like it's it's hard to know because Cavan aren't up that much, so it's hard to know really where Mayo are at. We'll know this Saturday probably. Yeah, and I, look, I to be honest with you, even though they they, they won out comfortable enough against Cavan, I thought they were so profligate in front of in front of goals. They like I I really. It's the same old failing for Mayo, and ultimately that'll be what'll cost them. Like I, I have, I, I think Ross Cowan won't get a better opportunity to beat Mayo than they have currently. I, I think Mayo are not in a great place. To be perfectly frank, I think Ross Cowan know the template that Mayo can't deal with, which is thirteen low block, yeah. hit them on the counter attack. Mayo will not be able to create enough scores, and Ross Cowan nick a goal. I, I think there's a real opportunity, and I've been interested in Davy Burke's comments. While I don't necessarily agree with him in the sense that he's putting all the he's putting all the eggs in the Mayo basket. That's all he's talked about is beating Mayo, beating Mayo, beating Mayo. They could easily come. They could easily come a cropper against Cavan in the following round. 
But yeah. what I will say, what I will say, and they're and they're more than capable of doing that because they are a bit Jekyll and Hyde. But what I will say is, I think I think they have a phenomenal opportunity to beat Mayo. Um, like you you don't know you don't know what Mayo what will show up, but I think I think Ross Common won't get a better opportunity. And to be fair, I thought they actually kicked some lovely scores. Uh, against Dublin the other day until like as Dublin tend to do with 15 minutes to go they just outpower you outcondition you um, yeah. But, yeah. But, but Dublin Dublin can deal with that kind of May or Roscommon setup much better than what Mayo will and I, I think there's a template there for Roscommon if they just have the bit of balls to go and do it yeah yeah lads listen I'd say things will get spicy now over the next few weeks I know obviously this weekend won't decide anything but it'll go a long way to decide what happens on the last day but lads listen thanks for the insights brilliant insights again from you Stevie Mark, before you go here. before you go before you go what happened come on our, our listeners deserve to know our <laughs> lads, listeners lads, deserve, deserve lads, to know why the crack. podcast is late I've got, got a bag look I've got a crack on the screen I've been out of action all week and, a crack you know, in your screen fun. Couldn't get the parts on the screen. You know, the and floor. nothing to do with United win the FA Cup, no? Not a thing. Not a thing. Or the lads, bank holiday. I was in Manchester on Sunday morning. I was in Manchester on Sunday morning. Here, lads, <laughs> listen, look, great, great, great to hear from you. And look, listen, we'll, we'll get back on next week. Mark, if you're at the Sandy Park match, you can maybe share your insights with us next week. Maybe on, yeah. on that game, it'd be great from a tactical point of view for our coaches to find out what's going on in, in, in both those setups. Like, But listen, Ledge, look after yourselves, lads. Thanks very much, boys. Thank All you. Right, Good luck. Thank Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.